Hey everyone, so I thought I'd do a screencast for uh, the beginning of chapter 15, which is essentially uh, the start of tracing evolutionary history. And specifically, it's on the origin of life. So how did uh, all these living things come to be? And really, when considering this, to get all the way to humans and gorillas and monkeys and stuff, you have to start way back when the Earth actually first uh, began existing, right? So this is way back to the Big Bang, which is uh, scientists estimate to be about 12 to 14 billion years ago. And it took a long, long time uh, between that time for Earth to actually form. So a long, long time passed before Earth actually came into existence. Uh, and that was about 4.6 billion years ago. Now, as Earth was forming, basically it was a, a, a collection of basically uh, dirt and gases and uh, you know basically matter starting to accumulate and because of this because of these sort of particles building up uh, the earth's surface essentially became very hot and basically for the longest time earth was just sort of this floating ball of molten lava uh, in space and as time passed on more and more matter started started to accumulate uh, on the surface of Earth, eventually you got uh, things to the point where uh, less matter, less dense matter started to uh, accumulate and basically the Earth's crust was formed. And it wasn't until about 3.9 billion years ago that the Earth's surface uh, stopped being such an inhospitable place. In other words, it stopped being bombarded with uh, meteorites. It wasn't uh, being compressed and heated by gravity so much. Uh, so there was a significant change around 3.9 billion years ago. The atmosphere at this time as it was changing was pretty thick with water vapor and then there were constant uh, what we would consider right now toxic compounds being spewed into the air from the many volcanoes that existed on the Earth's surface. So this started spewing uh, nitrogen and carbon dioxide and other things that we view as incompatible with life. Uh, and it was at that time. It took another, uh, you know, 400 million years for essentially life to become possible on Earth. Uh, and this started to appear once Earth started to cool down. Uh, the the uh, essentially the vapors uh, started to condense, and so some of that uh, vapor started to precipitate and eventually uh, condensed and formed oceans and a water source, which is you know required for life. The earliest possible evidence that we have uh, that life on Earth existed was about 3.5 3 billion years ago, and this is uh, from these uh, um, stromatolite rocks that you see right here that scientists have found. Basically these are rocks that are created by secretions from photosynthetic prokaryotes, and basically they make a layer, a layer, a layer, uh, eventually building up into this um, hard deposit like a rock. Uh, and that was 3.5 billion years ago. And that was from a photosynthetic prokaryote, remember that, um, which also has led scientists to believe that life actually started before this 3.5 billion years uh, mark because, you know, photosynthetic prokaryotes, the ones that added the actual oxygen to our atmosphere, were uh, an innovation, right? So there were earlier prokaryotes that were not photosynthetic, uh, that were anaerobic, that lived must have lived before them, right? So this 3.5 billion years evidence is the earliest time we can say that life existed on Earth based on evidence. But scientists are inferring that it, you know, it must have begun before that, between 3.9 and uh, 3.5 billion years ago. Now, what do you need to do if you're going to make uh, a life on Earth? Well, it's actually really just four simple steps, and the rest of this. You know, this chapter on origins of life is going to be uh, lending support to these four possible steps. Um, I've put them steps like that because these are, you know, these are hypotheses basically. But there is some evidence to support them. So if you are if you are a um, very early Earth organism, these are the four steps you'd have to go through to be created and to to, to become that first initial membrane encapsulated organism okay so you'd have to find a way uh, abiotically uh, that is without living other, other living organisms you'd have to abiotically synthesize 
these small organic molecules. So essentially, you need to make the monomers for all of the uh, all the polymers that we see in, in, in life. You know, and we started our, our studies, our AP Biology studies, looking at these polymers. So what are we talking about? We're talking about proteins, we're talking about uh, nucleic acids, we're talking about carbohydrates. In order for those things to happen, you need to have the small uh, small organic molecules to sort of link them up. So you need to need to be able to create these things abiotically on that somewhat harsh uh, early existence of Earth. Okay, you need to be able to create the the polymers. In other words, you need to be able to join these monomers together. That gets a little complicated because you know when we were studying this earlier in in, in class, essentially I told you that enzymes are involved and it takes a great deal of energy and it's this really organized process. But the early on steps to create these polymers were sort of random luck. Uh, it was basically the condensation and aggregation of these monomers together. Um, by the way, all the, de all the details of this are also in your book. You would have to also find a way to encapsulate these polymers inside of a uh, protective shell, essentially. Uh, and this is the idea of a, a proto uh, protocell, the first cell, essentially. And so you'd have to some find some way to put these polymers uh, into a biological membrane to sort of enclose it, and that would be your first sort of primitive cell. Now, you'd have to create a self-replicating molecule, and this is the part that gets really, really tricky, right? How does that first self-replicating molecule come about? Uh, and the answer is, well, we don't really know the answer, but scientists have, have sort of inferred that um, many, 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 many different processes have tried to become self-replicating molecules um, and they just failed until that one self-replicating molecule sort of came about in existence by accident. So this is sort of the, uh, the idea that, you know, if you put a thousand uh, monkeys on typewriters in a, into a room that eventually they'll write Shakespeare totally by accident, totally by um, just trying things over and over and over and over again. So this first cell really came into existence on accident. Uh, it came into existence by being, uh, and I want to say being perseverant because that gives it some sort of human characteristic, but uh, it happened by accident uh, through these processes happening so many times. So what's some of the evidence for this? Well, the evidence for the uh, abiotic synthesis, uh, synthesis of organic molecules came from uh, a guy named Miller. This is Stanley Miller's research. and. Basically, what he did is he, he did through a bunch of different experiments. He tried to simulate uh, early Earth conditions using uh, a lab apparatus, basically. So um, to do that, you know, he he heated a water in a, in a flask and sort of created the early hot seas. So you see that here. It's a, basically a flask of water being heated up. Now this heating would cause vapor to rise in through this tube right here. And then as this uh, water vapor, which as we said before, was, was probably the, the simulating the early Earth's atmosphere, he put it into a, a, another flask that added a spark, basically, a spark to, to add energy to this reaction and to stimulate um, various joining of molecules, right? So in, in this instance, these electrodes right here are simulating the high UV radiation and the, the high amounts of, of lightning that were probably found in the early Earth's atmosphere. Now he added this condenser part right here uh, to make some of this water vapor that's been charged fall out into a solution, right? So it's going to basically precipitate once it's condensed. And this would be like the rain falling to Earth. Um, containing whatever was made in this reaction up here. So as it falls uh, down into this tube here, basically Miller would take samples of this and, and, and analyze it for some of the uh, organic molecules that he hypothesized were being formed. And, and sure enough, when he went back and looked at uh, the contents of some of these samples, he found things like hydrocarbons and amino acids, which showed him and others that uh, these organic molecules could be created uh, abiotically. Now there were other alternative hypotheses out there. Uh, 
you know, people looked at other atmospheres because people don't necessarily agree on what the, the Earth's early atmosphere was. Did it have nitrogen? Did it have carbon dioxide? It doesn't matter. The, the fact of the matter is that the, early, uh, the alternative atmospheres also showed that you can make uh, these organic molecules. You found amino acids and uh, hydrocarbons in every instance. They also looked in uh, uh, simulated volcanoes. Uh, being that volcanoes would add some of the components like nitrogen to the atmosphere to make these uh, chemical processes possible, and they also found um, they also found these uh, organic molecules. In fact, when they used uh, the technologies available to them in 2008, they found uh, about twice as much as Miller found uh, with the resources that were available to 1953. So you know. Is actually more than twice the amount of organic molecules found in those experiments. Um, submerged volcanoes and hydrothermal vents could have played a role in, in creating the, the appropriate atmosphere for this. My personal favorite meteorites, um, meteorites actually bringing some of the seed organic molecules uh, to Earth and then kind of running that process and, and starting that process. Because that, you know, if you're thinking about it, really. That hypothesis could could basically say that there's some other uh, planet or set of organisms out there in the universe that are that have sent these things out to Earth. So sort of the extraterrestrial um, hypothesis, I guess. Uh, by the way, if you haven't seen this movie uh, in your lifetime, shame on you. You should probably go check it out. It's a great movie. All right, moving right along. Uh, three minutes, last three. So the other three pieces of evidence that, that support becoming uh, a cell is the fact that um, you have to create polymers. Uh, polymers meaning you have to basically be able to string together, um, say, amino acids in a row to get a protein. And basically, research, uh, they, they found that you could do that. In fact, um, RNAs that act as enzymes, so-called ribozymes, uh, are still found today. Um, you have to be able to make a membrane. So what they're showing in here is the is the formation of a membrane. In fact, you can get membranes within membranes uh, at the bench. You can actually make these things at the bench due to the uh, the nature of a hydrocarbon, due to the nature of something like a um, a lipid coming together and and, and uh, creating a membrane. Now, the, the, probably the most important thing is this replicative genetic material, so this so-called RNA world hypothesis. And definitely go back to the book and read some of the details on this, but essentially what people are saying is that even though we know nowadays that DNA is the genetic material, DNA would have essentially been a, a, an innovation for passing on genetic material from one generation to the next. Uh, the older model, so the, the so-called originator of genetic material, people hypothesize was actually RNA. So if you look at this RNA world hypothesis, and by the way, there's a really interesting video right here if you if you have time to watch it, is basically you have a collection of these RNA monomers, and if you put them into a situation where they can kind of be condensed and brought together, you get these random strings of RNA uh, that can act as primitive genes. So essentially you get these random amalgams of, uh, of, of RNA strung together. And they strung together in different sequences. So these are essentially the, the first primitive genes. Once you have these primitive RNA genes, essentially the other RNA monomers can come in complementary base pair with that. So it's it can replicate itself that way. Uh, and basically an RNA replicative genetic material. Eventually, you know, mismatches would be made. So those would be the mutations. Those would lead to innovations. Eventually you'd have a more stable DNA molecule taking over for RNA. And so that's basically the way it happened. You started to push uh, this replicative material into more stable ways. You started to, to vary the sequences by, by accumulating mutations. And eventually, these mutations just led to a, a diverse array of, of organisms. And then with the stabilization of DNA, uh, it allowed these changes to, be, to last longer inside these primitive cells. So definitely go back and check this chapter out. I'm going to use a few of these things on the test, so I hope you check this video out. 
Uh, I hope that helped. Make sure you do the reading, though, because there's lots of good information in there, too. Talk to you soon.